And we're live. Hey, this is Paul Ash with They Talk Funny. Uh, my special guest who's with me right here, right now, is the amazing Deborah Kemet. Uh, Kemet did I say Kemet? It's, it's Kemet, but it's yeah. close. And it, it's, as long as I'm not calling you late for dinner, I imagine you're, you're, you're happy or... Yeah, for uh, yeah, sure. She's just, she's just completely upset with how cornball I am. No, I'm not. I was just having this little moment where everything was on a delay, and I was like... Trying to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> I am a little bit of a motor mouth. I'm going to just uh, switch you over there, which makes it easier to go like this uh, if you're answering any questions. For those of you who are watching, say hello in uh, whatever box, whether you're watching us on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, say hi. Let us know where you're watching from. And if you're watching this on review, it's too late to type that in. But uh, uh, give us a like anyways. Just hit the like uh, button and uh that kind of encourages me to do more of these, and I'm I'm kind of stoked because uh, Deborah Deborah is, is well uh, she's an author, uh, she she uh, is a performer. Uh, you were with Second City for how long? Should I ask that? Is that polite to ask? Well, I started there in 1981, and I was there performing for about three years, and then I kept coming back to direct. And I then I taught there, and then I came back to perform, and uh, I was a director and performer. And, so and I've, I'm until the last 15 years. So I was probably there off and on for 20 years. Off and on for 20 years. And that's that's uh, you also with the touring group. Is that true? I was on the main stage. Oh, you were and, main stage. Yeah, on Lombard Street, which was uh, where it was originally. And then um, they moved over to Blue Jays Way. I was a director by that point. Yeah. So yeah, so does that mean Lombard that you started in the Tim Sims? No, no, way no. before that. Oh, Lombard way before that. was okay. the old yeah, fire that hall. In the nineties. Yeah, you know, it was the eighties. I was in nineteen eighty one, and it was Lombard Street, which was the original Second City. It was at the old fire hall, and that's right. where the whole thing started. Um, I think I was about three or four years from after the cast that you know went on to SCTV and things like that. Okay. Now, uh, you're also a writer and author, and you, you've done such things as like the Winnipeg Comedy Festival. Uh, but you kind of briefly told me you don't, you're not a comedian. You're you're a performance artist, or, or uh, you do. No, I'm a comedian, but I mean, I just don't do classic stand up where I'm in a club very much. I've never performed in a club since probably I was in my early twenties. I decided early on I wanted to do shows in bigger theaters and so i've taken my show all over canada to theaters you know like what they <laughs> when i went to the winnipeg comedy festival they told me i'm a soft bomb comic which meant my shows work in theaters so um and then i started to do more stand-up later on like in my 48 you know where i was going to places like the winnipeg comedy festival etc now they said soft bomb not like soft seat no, soft bum. Oh, soft bum. 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 Yeah, All maybe right. they yes. meant soft seat. Yeah, not yeah, soft okay. bum. That's when I really failed. Just a soft yeah. bum. Yeah, I, I, I don't really I, I was that. Going, that's that was a very polite. Just uh, uh, my way of saying you suck. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> you sucked, but just not that hard. Okay. Uh, oh, bum. She was so inoffensive. Nothing happened on stage. <laughs> I don't know. It's just semantics in the business, I think, but. Um, it's yeah, funny. I did improv and sketch and toured those shows. And then in my 30s and 40s, started to tour shows, um, you know, just a lot of women's conferences and theaters would book me. And, like, you know, the Empire Theater in Belleville and Kingston Grand Theater. And I just always wanted to do it in bigger centers because uh, you could earn a living that way. <laughs> it's, it's a concept. It's very it's uh, it's, a it's a lot more like uh, British British stand ups will graduate out of the clubs and, and then tour theaters because yeah. yeah. they have theaters. Uh, I suppose yeah. Halifax, my hometown, you would have played the Rebecca Cohen. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. I've gone I've gone all over Canada, and uh, sometimes people bring me in uh, to perform. Right now, my show Downward Facing Broad, which was about turning sixty, um, was on it was uh, scheduled for a tour all over. Of course, when COVID hit, it didn't happen anymore. But yeah, sometimes I would put the tour together where I'd go to them and rent the space. But a lot of times it was a partnership with somebody bringing me in. 
to the theater. But it's a nice theater because it also suited my age group better. Uh, the the yeah. soft seats, uh, the soft seats, and also you know when I went out and did a show one night, I always have a musician with me, and we could do okay. We could do okay number wise, so we could get enough people in. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, there's definitely a, a process in that. Um, now, you're also very much involved with with uh, uh, or at least I see a presence on your 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 uh, Facebook page. Uh, with LGBTQ, uh, uh, you want to keep awareness, uh, I believe? Um, I just put that up today. I mean, obviously, I'm pro-LGBTQ. That was just, uh, I just, I very rarely post anything political. So that was just today. But I, I find people, to, I just like to say positive things because people tend to go and say negative things. Negative so too often. Yes. Right. And I just figured, yeah, if you haven't got anything good to say, don't say it online for sure. Yeah. No, uh, most definitely sounds like my parents, except they never said online, uh, which is it's advice I've passed on to my daughter as well. Uh, now, you, when you're writing, you seem to draw a lot from your your life experiences. You there's, I mean, you mentioned your ex husband a little bit in some of the clips I've seen, uh, but it's also uh, you talk about your family members and your experiences. Uh, what what. Do you always have a notebook handy or, or do you think about it or do you do, do you task write and say, I need to. I write every day. I, I write, I write all the time because I'm not just writing for comedy. I, I write, I've written, just wrote another new book and it's going to be launched. So I'm always taking notes. I don't necessarily go out and listen to what people say, but when I get home, I'll think that's something I want to talk about. Um, and then sometimes I'm writing for a project that is actually due I also find that I write about my family, but it's not my real family. It's like a fake comedy family. Like my ex-husband didn't say half the things that I say about him, but <laughs> some ex-husband did. And, um, and my, my kids, like my kids are really in the profession as well. So they're in their thirties and, uh, you know, like we have jokes, I make jokes about them, but they kind of represent that age group. They're not necessarily my kids, you know, right. it's really funny because, um, I used to play this character in one of my shows called Uncle Garney, or Cousin Garney. And it was, it was made up from a guy I heard on a voice. Like I just heard his voice one day and I started imitating him. And it wasn't a real person. I didn't even know this person, but I decided, like, I always feel like if you can insult your own family, it's easier. So I called him Cousin Garney, but now people think he actually exists. And what's really funny is my mom and her sisters are always arguing about who he really is. Like, uh, it's that <laughs> uncle. And I'm like, no, he doesn't exist. But he exists, like he's just a yahoo that exists in every family, right? So, uh, yeah, I've always kind of like told the truth, but not necessarily what happened to me. Like, I'm not a verbatim thing. There's lots of truth in what happened, but it's not the facts, if that makes any sense. And, oh, that make, that makes a lot of sense for the, it, it's the, there's There's embellishment and also... Uh, a little bit of farming from around the world, uh, around yes, the environment. Yes, yeah. it's some family or somebody. And then I've always tried to do comedy where I'm the idiot, where I don't understand the thing, as opposed to say it's about somebody else. So a lot of times people think, oh, that happened to you. And I'm like, no, it happened to the guy next to me down there. But I think it's funnier if it happened to me and I'm the confused one. So I've always played it that way. Yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, that that actually kind of goes into the argument about punching up or punching down. If you you're making yourself the the the, the target, then yeah. it's going to be less offensive when it's it's being said uh, out loud or at a club. Yeah, um, yeah, and I also this past show uh, there were some topics I wanted to talk about, and it was really you know it's a real sensitive time, and I really wanted to make I got the make sure I got the tone right. So I had a guy who was a millennial, like thirty two. And he directed my show. And I said, it really was helpful for me because, you know, the tone of comedy has changed over the years. And I wanted to get the tone right. I didn't want it to sound like a grumpy woman talking about millennials. And I also didn't want to put myself down because the whole point of Downward Facing Broad was to stay visible as an older woman. Mm -hmm. And so he got the tone right. I mean, and again, he's in his 30s. The sound of comedy, the rhythm, totally different. Than when I was gro going up, growing up through 
you know, the different types of humor. I also didn't like when people put people down in the audience. I never, yeah. people said, oh, I better not sit at the front. And I'm like, I've never put anybody down unless like they're, they're wanting to be teased. But I'm a person who I like, I like it being the show is on me as opposed to hurting somebody. No, I definitely agree. The only people that should be treated or picked on in an audience is a heckler. Um, that's, yeah, that's, for sure. Yeah. I don't honestly get that many hecklers because I, I in soft in the soft bum community, uh, no, they don't, uh, they, they, you know, once in a while you do, if you're in like a corporate gig or something, but mm. Generally, people like also they come to see me, so it's not like I'm just somebody. When I'm somebody on a bill uh, with other people, yeah, they they I have to work harder to get them interested. But if someone's paid a ticket to see me, that they're not going to do that as much. Unless there's once in a while a couple of women are drunk and they get like mouthing off and and they usually cry halfway through. But uh, generally speaking, I don't have too much trouble with that. Now, in the earlier days, when I was younger and doing like corporate gigs for Christmas and stuff, there's nothing worse mm -hmm. than being up there and somebody drunk and just taking a hit, you know, like you're the, you're the target. But um, yeah. I don't, I kind of didn't want, I stopped doing that years ago. I don't want to be in that kind of theater or that kind of environment. So the type of gigs I take are different. No, I, yeah. I can definitely see that. I, 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 uh, all right. I'm, this is supposed to be about you, but I had, I did a Christmas gig. You just reminded me of, and it was, it was in a bar and it was two separate companies had bought out the bar for the night. And, uh, one of those companies only found out that their Christmas bonus was the comedy show that. Uh, I was doing. Oh, what a, oh, oh my God. I can feel your pain already. So, I may have yeah. to have a drink of water. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, me, was it, hard me night? uh, it was definitely a hard night. I, I was thankfully, I was just the, the MC. Uh, but, uh, we, we showed up early, of course, uh, cause it was a bar attached to a hotel. And as we were checking in, uh, the manager came over and said, Hey, uh, since you're here early, do you want to start <laughs> early? Cause, uh, they've been, <laughs> um, drinking on their boss's tab. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, you're the. Yeah, and you're the present. You're the Christmas bonus. Yeah, yeah one time uh, about it was uh, my my he's my ex husband now, but we're very good friends. And he was my anniversary, and I had a gig for Warren Paving, and it was all guys and a few women, but most of the women were wives who probably didn't want to be there, and they were so drunk that when they started handing out the door prizes for the Christmas bonus. People wouldn't get up. They're like, I'm not saying you know, stupid. Like they were leather coats and they weren't getting up for them. And it was at a hall and and my, I had an hour to do. And they said, please don't cut back. We want the whole hour. And I was bombing so bad at one point. I just thought, well, they're going to get the full hour because that's what they said. And even the bartender was going cut, cut. But that was the last time I can honestly remember it being that horrible. But uh, mm. I also don't want to do those kind of gigs anymore. I haven't had to. So thank God I haven't got them. But I paid my dues on that one, I think. Uh, Peter Bowen is here. He's saying uh, Talk Funny is back. He's kind of glad to see it. Uh, we're talking with Deborah Kimmett, uh, actor, uh Theater comedian, uh, and, or comedian. We'll say comedian, author. Comedian. Yes, that's yeah. it. I just met a not classic stand up in a bar. That's all. And uh, her website is there. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, just type them into the chat. We'll we'll bring them up. Uh, we briefly touched on the, uh, the 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 I guess the sort of lead into that was about hecklers. Uh, I believe in the rule of three when it comes to hecklers. Do you do you have any? hard set rules for performance. Uh, I know that you work with a director, so you're usually on script. Uh, but even when in your writing, do you find that you have uh, set rules? That, for what? You follow like uh, uh, certain corners that, that you make sure that you, you keep your character in while, while you're, you're writing, or if you want to rethink something. I know that you, you, you said that you don't write anything that's mean or. Um. No, mine are really shaped. It's like an hour of, it's all connected to one theme, my show. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, and I guess, um, I, I mean, I don't, 
write on the fly very often, though when I go out and do shows, I'll, I'll change things that aren't working or get more efficient. Um, yeah, I don't have anything like that. I mean, I, I write it very, and I go and rehearse in a theater to work out the parts that I'm not sure if I want to say yet. So I don't go to a small club and work it out the way some, like a stand up might. I work it in rehearsal. Um, and then I take it out and usually I'll get notes on that from the director. And, uh, and then by the time the show's out three or four times, it's getting pretty solid. Okay. Yeah. No, a lot of also the rule of threes also comes when it, we're talking about, uh, how many times you'll tag uh, something or if you're doing a list, a comedic list. Uh, yeah, I don't write like that though. I write, I mean, I'm a, yeah, I don't I see, have I that. I love the math of what you're talking about yeah. though. Cause it's, it's, uh, my show is about an hour and 10 minutes. So I have to have a different, I know when, um, I can do a setup as three and all that. I can do a list, but it, that won't, that, that length of time, it doesn't, the rhythm has to change in the comedy, you know? Mm -hmm. So I do more of a longer stories in that time that don't have to have that kind of setup punchline type of thing. So I have to work, I, you know, it changes rhythm. And again, I don't always know that going to work until I'm in front of an audience I usually do um, a lot of tests around like um, there's a cafe in my hometown and it seats 60 and I'll go in and work on the show uh, for the summer and then take it out in the fall kind of thing because hmm. I already know they like me in my hometown and the, it sells out and it's not very much money to come and then when I come to the bigger theaters I'm my show's really solid <clears throat> excuse me uh, no, yeah. Uh, all right, you just finished your. I, I'm I'm bringing it back to threes, but it, your third book, fourth book, it, fourth book. It's your fourth yeah. book. Ah, oh, so yeah. we just broke the rule of threes. Uh, where, what, what's uh? Do you want to tease us with a title for the the new? Well, book? it's called Window Shopping for God, and my first uh, two books were just essays of comedy, which were I wrote for a few magazines in Canada for a while. So I just put these this two of the books were just essays and then another one was a novel called out running crazy and um it was the first novel i'd ever written very hard for me um i like it more like memoir kind of writing so window shopping for god is it's it's sort of semi-funny serious it's got like um i came out of a small community very religious and letting go of religion and then finding these things in my life that connected me as I did all this. I mean, it's a lot of humor about self-help and all the things I did to stay sane. And um, the book has been, uh, it's at a publisher and agent and all that stuff is going on. I have no idea if it's gonna, where it's going to go right now, but if it needs another rewrite, I'll do that before Christmas. So it's about 260 pages yet. And, and uh, downward facing broad uh do you want to explain sort of the tone of that yeah like that was uh that was a good one about you know um which was stage show for anyone that's watching sorry yes yeah stage show and i've done it all over it's also one of it's the name of my comedy cd and that's on um it was produced by first off the cbc did it as a comedy special for the radio and then howl and roar um the cd uh they produced the CD and they put it all over the States and just for last radio and Sirius XM. And um, yeah, so it was about what happens to you when you turn 60 and how you get put out to pasture. And it's all the humor of having to receive the first seniors discount to not being ghosted by most of society can't hear you or see you after 60. And then also the, the roles that you're supposed to sort of fall into as a woman. I mean, cause I'm a woman, I, it's not particularly female. And also just all these places where I tried to get my power back. Um, yeah, so it's been fun. I've done this, I went out to Bowen Island, did it in Vancouver. As I said, it was gonna go across Ontario with it. And uh, the comedy CD, is more like traditional stand-up because it's been able to be like there's lots of tracks that have been ex extracted so that it, it's got like 12 tracks as opposed to the longer stories that i tell within the actual piece itself 
Yeah. Uh, but like yeah. a good comedy album, there's a full arc to it because. Yeah. Yeah. They really, I really don't, I uh, don't, you probably know Alison Dorr. Yes. Uh, oh my, she's fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Isn't she great? And she's just been on my side the whole time. And uh, it's, it's funny because the day, you know, when they were just kind of closing the borders to the States during COVID and it was that day they closed the border was the first female comedy radio station op opened in New York City. And I went, well, it's the end of the world then. If we're equal now, we're just going to die because we've never been equal. And and then this CD has really done well. So it's been great because it's gotten a lot of traction out there. So that's nice. But it's got a real, like my other comedy shows were like children and work and da, da, da. But this is very focused on aging and ageism. And ironically, what I wrote about, though, after COVID, I still could write much more about ageism because it's much more serious now that, you know, we've got so many people in nursing homes not being protected. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, I've been doing a little excerpts from that. Um, I do sort of some I don't know. Have you, have you done um, since COVID? Have you done? like live comedy shows on uh, Facebook live or. Oh uh, yeah. I've done a few. Um, I, and, it's sort of weird without the audience interaction so much. And so I, hard. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, how do you, how do you do them then? How do I do them? Um, well, I just meant, like I did one, we had three improvisers. I did a bit of stand up, but the truth was the stand up is brutal. It was really hard to figure out if it was working Mm -hmm. um we had a musician and the, the best part was the stories where we just told stories because it was a father's day special but i just wondered if you had done like classic stand-up um show uh, i uh, the uh, probably the one that went the best it was it was an east coast show uh and uh, uh it basically was an online open mic and but what they did is they were using zoom so they were able to bring the audience in as well so we could hear the audience Oh, good. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's like uh, I, at one point a baby started crying during somebody else's set and they didn't mute the mic fairly quick. And so all you could hear was the baby crying, not hear the, the, the performer. Uh, but uh, yeah, my set went well. Being I didn't try anything too much new just because of the fact that getting used to the format was enough. So I yeah, made it easier for yeah. me to hold hold everyone's attention and it's stuff that I had the rhythm to. Uh, so yeah. once you hit the rhythm. Well, you know, I did it. I did something like downward facing broad jokes, but it was kind of like throwing a bowling alley, way, <laughs> a bowling ball down an alley. It's like, clunk, 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 clunk. you're not sure if you're getting the laugh. We could see people reacting. Uh, we were on StreamYard as well. And I love this. Uh, this uh, fantastic. Dan and Gage, you do an amazing thing. Yeah. <laughs> But you know what was the weirdest part? We did everything right. We rehearsed. We knew how to bring people in. We had no Wi-Fi about 20 minutes before the show started. Oh, no. I, um, I think I almost, if you, you know, I may have to go get a heart stent because I literally thought I, and I was in charge of everything. And it was, we sold a lot of tickets. Um, but ugh, it was so scary. And it was a fundraiser, too. So we really wanted it to go. We didn't want it to just. We wanted it to make some money. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, uh, what do you think we'll do to adapt to all this? Uh, I, th I think, like, I, I do a panel show uh, as well. Uh, and uh, it, I've been doing it live for seven, eight years. No, nine years. Yeah, probably nine years. And everyone says, you should do it online. And I, I just was going, yeah, but I don't know how. And then COVID hit. And it's like, well, now I have time to learn how. And so uh, I do a, a nerd comedy battle show called Battlecom. Um, and is it like this, where there, except there be three people? Uh, it's we actually I have a panel of four, uh, mm -hmm. and I have a, a stage manager to assist and bounce stuff off of. And uh, we are very interactive with the audience, and it's a uh, it, it's a comedy battle. So they're they're given a topic ahead of time so they can pre-write. It's sort of like the debaters. Yeah. Uh, just uh, whereas the debaters will take one topic and have two performers for half an hour. Uh, yeah. We take three topics and we have four performers 
uh, on each of the topics for about an hour. So yeah. it's very, very fast paced. Uh, oh, that's in, good. Yeah. In, uh, yeah. I've been on the debaters now for 14 years and yeah. um, I was on the first one uh, when I went to the Winnipeg Comedy Festival and we didn't know if it was going to go. It was really funny because we, uh, I got there and they said, do you want to be on this? Like I got the job for the Winnipeg Comedy Festival and they said, do you want to be on this thing called the Master Debaters? And <laughs> I went, that's what it was called. Yeah. And I was on the very first one with Lara Ray. And Lara's honestly, amazing person, by the way. Yes. Yeah. And we had no idea. I mean, we, we knew the audience really liked it, but there was an afternoon of, we all had topics. We, they do two topics a half hour. Okay. So, yeah, we do um, two topics a half hour and then we um, shoot or we tape six shows. Right. So, sorry, three shows and six debates per night. Right. And usually it, there's two nights, so they get um, six shows out of one location. Yep. Um, yeah, so it's been going well. It, I mean, it's a fun, it's a very fun gig. What What made me laugh was um, the original title for Battlecom, which is short for Battle Comedy, was Master Debaters. Uh, but mm-hmm. then I didn't want people thinking we were ripping off the debaters. And now mm. I realize that subconsciously I had been ripping off the debaters. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you've mentioned also the 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 change that has come uh, in comedy uh, since you started performing. Uh, what? How do you view, view these changes that that have happened? There's a lot of people who are very negative and sort of fight against, uh, uh, like they they don't they they. Uh, like Jerry Seinfeld said that he wouldn't do colleges, uh, that PC culture is destroying comedy. Um, I have my views. I'd like to hear yours. Well, I'm not out there in that in that realm of colleges. I never have been, so I don't know the difference. But I did talk to um, Abdul Butt Boot. But, but, sorry. But, Abdul I've Butt. been trying to say soft bottom. Uh, Abdul soft bottom. Uh, yeah, I was speaking to him about it. You know, he's 32 mm-hmm. at the time I spoke to him. And he said it was like he feels too old to do it because he said whatever I'm doing is offending and I'm not sure what I'm doing. And I was like, at 32, if you feel that, I can't imagine 42, 52, 62. But I feel I that's why I said I got a millennial to direct my show because Things that are not even offensive, I was questioning, you know, um, also the overuse of terminology, which I didn't want to get a laugh at the expense of the person using it. I wanted to get the laugh at me misusing, um, right. like one of them is othering. My, my, my kids said that to me, like, oh, you're othering them. And, I, and I'm like, you're othering me. The, you're there's mother and it's got other in it. And, you know, I was like trying to take the joke, but make sure I'm on the right side of it. Yeah. And at first I thought maybe I'm side soft peddling everything. It felt like I was being so politically correct. And then I thought, but I think that's what we're going to have to go through to get to the other side of what this is going to look like. Cause there is stuff that was acceptable, even in my own comedy that I shudder at now. And I didn't even think I was being politically incorrect 20 years ago. I thought I was being very open-minded, but it was who was getting, who is at the brunt of the joke is part of it for me. If so, who is getting laughed at is really key for me, whether it can be said or not. It's like men's ray has come to comedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, men's ray, uh, men's ray, sorry, the uh, Latin of guilty mind. It's, it's the difference between murder and manslaughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, is is the intent is what's what's important yeah and i don't think when people used to go out especially in clubs and stuff it was to say the stuff that you know there was almost like a commitment to say stuff you shouldn't say you know like that was part of comedy and i still think some job is that it's how to do it so that you're not hurting people you know um i've done the debaters with two Lots of people, but two younger comics, Deanne Smith and Ivan Decker. Mm -hmm. And they are what I would call punching up. 
And I said, it's so fantastic to work with them that you can actually work with people. Them not putting me down because I'm an older woman and me not putting them down because they're younger. And I was like, where's the comedy? Well, there's lots of comedy in that. There's lots of comedy in the misunderstandings and and uh, all of it. And I, I've learned a lot from them. And I've learned a lot from the older comics. I think the older comics, the biggest part right now, whether you're older or younger, I think is, are you going to evolve with what's going on, right? Yeah. Are you? You know, because right now I even think stand up as we know it is shifting a lot with COVID. So like, what is it going to be? Is it always going to be? the way we did it before, or is there going to be a new form come up? Yeah, I do believe I that, that. We're, we're going to see a, a change and we're going to see that, that, that there is going to be an online presence to, to, to comedy, to theater yeah. and, and stand up, uh, even when the clubs do reopen. Um, yeah. And I think it's also nice because you could go tonight and do a small club downtown Toronto, 20 people show up. And you don't really make very much money. So it's not, and you don't really even get the experience sometimes if depending on what part of the night you're in, like if you're in the worst part of the night. So you're not getting the experience that you really want. Like I have performed all over the world, sketch, stand up, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And you've got that time in front of an audience, but you know how many times you've gone out and you didn't get what you needed to get better at your craft. Yeah. But I do think online you can draw a better, bigger audience sometimes and a bet and an audience where you can really let yourself be known in a different way than you could at a club where everyone's just having a drink. Right. Right. Most definitely. Um, yeah. It's very intimate online. Yeah. I, uh, one of the other things is, um, I actually perform in burlesque shows quite often. Now yeah. tell me about this. Yeah. I want to hear uh, more about this. I, well, is it, it burlesque it, like classic where you come on and do comedy amidst dancing? Uh, not so amidst, dancing? sort of in between or... Uh, I mean. like, um, you're like, they dance and then you come out and you're like a sort of vaudeville type of thing? That That's a show I produce in, in Montreal is called Voix de Ville, which is oh, that's wow. the root words for vaudeville. Was voice well, I didn't know it. that. That's uh, great. It, it's an old theater term, actually, in uh, in England when they would... Uh, the theater troops from London would go out to the the smaller hamlets to perform. They were the the voice of the city, the voix de ville. So there's and, dance, comedy, and music. And music. Oh wow, that sounds great. And if I when people complain about audiences being too politically correct, for me it's like I think you're just you're not working hard enough. You're not thinking things through. And if you want to take some kind of lazy route, uh, maybe that's that's why you're having a hard time connecting with audiences. So it, it's you you recognize that you're putting the work in. Uh, yeah, I think you do have to put a lot of work in, and I think you have to be curious. Like if you know, nobody. My friend used to say, nobody learns anything on a good day. So if you're getting money and pay, getting paid to do that kind of humor that you could do a few years ago, you're not going to get up one day and go, Hey, I'm going to change my whole act. It's usually because the shit's, oops, sorry. The, no, you know, like we, 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 you can say whatever you want. Oh, okay. Cause I'm, you know, not that much of a, I'd like to swear. Uh, but <laughs> I just think, you know, if you have to evolve, um, I probably would have done clubs more, but I had two small kids. So I did theaters cause I could make enough money to live. I wasn't going to go out and do little tiny sets for that. I did when I was in my 20s, except it was called improv. It wasn't stand-up comedy. But, you know, you have to log your 10,000 hours. And I think the more you get yourself on stage, then you... And also, I, I don't know about you, what you feel about this. I'd love to hear. Is Do you think... I don't. I think you can't blame the audience either. Like, you have to... The audience is there to get entertained. So my job is to entertain them as best I can. Some nights I don't hit with them but yeah what do you think is i just don't think it's on the audience to be the uh, problem um i i i don't believe you can teach comedy but i believe you can teach the 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 rules around it and i've done that before and i would always preface any course that i ran was uh that i can't teach you to be funny but i can teach you how to find your funny and utilize it better and one of the big things when people were telling me they were nervous i'm saying uh, an audience has come to a club because they want to laugh. All you need to do is provide the excuse. Yeah. And, and yeah, sometimes but if it's you're, a little harder to find the excuse for them, but. 
Right. And if your comedy isn't resonating with, I also teach comedy. I've taught, I have this thing called um, how to make the dog laugh. And it's just about how to make, how to write funny, not stand up. Right. And I always say, people do want to laugh, but you have to set it up so they can do it easily. Mm-hmm. But there was there were a couple of women in my, I did this at Second City about two years ago, and they were in their 50s. And they say, yeah, we're going down to Yuck Yucks at one in the morning. And we're and I said, but your your whole routine is not geared to the audience that would be there at one in the morning. Your routine is geared towards a women's group who wants to have a, a woman's night. And I said, so why don't you put yourself in front of an audience that wants what you have to offer? I think that's also important. I know what my audience is. I know it's women that come out to, in big groups. Ladies Night Out has been my friend and International Women's Day and all of that. And I know that, but I know a bunch of men who are at a conference and they see me. It'd be like your Christmas bonus uh, performance. Yes. They, they, I'm not what they want to see. They just left somebody like me at home. They're hoping for like a raunchy guy, right? I think it must be hard too for people who have to hire comics in this very politically correct thing for a corporate gig. That must be very challenging. It, well, it, it's it's one thing too. It, it's it's so hard. It's like uh, the boss will say to somebody, "I want you to hire a comic for for our little corporate gig." And so the person who's doing the hiring is probably looking more at budget than talent. Uh, and so really, because I, I've always found that they pay like incredible. They, they pay. And, in, yeah. Uh, I, well, you're at a different level than I am. And, and I'll, I'll if I'm booking something and they'll they'll come and, and they'll say, uh, well, we want we want uh, just one comic. Uh, but we want a 90 minutes show. I'm saying, well, okay, I could probably get three comics, uh, which, which yeah, would, that would be know, horrible, wouldn't it? To be 90 minutes, 90 <laughs> minutes of one comic, yeah. Oh, that'd be horrible, uh, unless you got like maybe your burlesque, burlesque show where you could sing and dance. Yeah, the other part is it's kind of like, um, and that's why burlesque sounds interesting to me. Is I, I love shows that where you break up the rhythm a lot, and I always mm-hmm. have a musician with my shows, I've had them for years. And because I think after a certain point, they need another sound other than my voice. And uh, I mean, I guess that's what kind of vaudeville would be like, where you had a bit of everything. And I think when you do something, you either have to like, if you're going to be calm, like most things, I'm doing an online gig next week. Mm -hmm. And they want me to do an hour at the end of the day. And I said, you know, no one's going to listen to me for an hour online after they've been online all day. So why don't you just be the, I'll be the MC and I'll do 15 minutes, 10 minutes, and then at the end do 20 minutes. And they went, oh, okay. And I said, yeah, because they don't want to hear me at this point. Like at that point, at three in the afternoon when the, the whole conference is winding down, they want to get offline and get into their pa- their pajamas or something. <laughs> so yeah, but it is it has changed the tone of comedy also because when I was coming into comedy, um, you know, like uh, it was very much, you know, set up punchline, set up punchline. And then when we were at Second City, it was all improv. And we tried to play with how long you could perform before you had to do a punchline. Mm-hmm. And today there's a lot of comedy out there, which is kind of anti-punchline. Like there's no punchline. It's just random. And I like I like watching when people can do that really well because it's so different the rhythm than when i was coming up through the classic comedy rhythms you know personally i love to sort of play with silences just kind yeah. of do a little bit of awkward be- if i can get like a a room of 200 people like to just hang on something that's, that's a great. little uncomfortable and then you, then one or two will crack it's uh, i think that that's that's that shows kind of control you know yes uh, and i like what lenny bruce used to say is you uh if you get the aha, if your story has the aha moment, at the same time you're getting it, saying it, and the audience is getting it at the same time, you just try to delay how long that's going to take. Because he would tell, like, I don't even know if we'd find him funny today, to be honest, but seven, eight minute story, and then everybody would get it at once. That's yeah. what you aim for, right? But sometimes with stand up, you don't really have that time because no. you've only got a few minutes. 
I, I think, I, well, he, there's physical proof now that human beings are evolving, but I think thought process has also evolved. And, and uh, with the training of, of these devices and such, our attention spans are, we have to kind of get to the point quicker. And I think comedy has sort of adapted to, to get to that. I think some formats give us a, a release by, by giving us more long form. Uh, but for well, the like a podcast doesn't have to have any humor, like it doesn't have comedy, but it doesn't, it's not really, pro it's not promising funny either. It's kind of just yeah. talking, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, and I, I think there's been that kind of evolution. I, um, this, this is an older thing to, to bring up, but Hannah Gadsby's Nanette, uh, I, she's had another special since then, but I, Douglas. I you, yeah, Douglas, uh, did, what did you think? Cause it was sort of groundbreaking when it came out. Uh, I, I considered it to be more, uh, a theater piece, but I definitely viewed it was important for comedy. Did you, do you, have I, I think that that's where I disagree. I think comedy has stand up has got too much limitation in that thought process between her and, um, Oh my God! One Mississippi um, Tig Notaro. Like Tig Notaro, I love yeah. that, that. That and um, the other guy who does <clears throat> one long, long story. Um, and I'll remember it in a minute. There you okay. go. You know the guy with the funny. I saw him at just for last. He was fantastic. Um, uh, Lord love us. Plays guitar. Big Bigelow. Uh, Mike. Um, oh, Mike Birbiglia. Like all of that breaks up the yeah. classics. And I love that. I loved her show, Douglas and mm -hmm. Nanette. I've watched it five, six times. It's brilliant. Now, that's the one woman show. That's what I would do. But her classic jokes still work. Yes. I just feel like as more females uh, get into comedy the rhythm of how we tell a story can change and it's not just female because mike does that he 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 puts themes through that all connected it's not just a set up joke it's a long story yeah. and i i think stand up or what because you're standing up while you're doing it that's why i think when i said i'm not stand up because i've done these stories in theaters mm. but i wonder if that's just that's what i mean about limitation of the art form it, mm. Maybe it's much broader than what we perceive it as right now. I, I, and I also I, think females tell stories differently. Yeah, I believe that there's yeah. there's a definite crossover and a, a definite uh, subset of skills. It's it's almost like what what type of music do you listen to? Like you know, is it rock? Is it prog rock? Is it country? Is it jazz? I think all of them require musical skill. Uh, and I think comedy in itself, it's breaking down club comic versus theater comic is is the same kind of discussion um, yeah it is really yeah you're right yeah. yeah but maybe um it's kind of too like vaudeville what, what you do too we there's certain traditions of how it's supposed to be that i think with bar comic or club comic we've got that yes because you do share the stage usually with five or six people in one evening mm -hmm it's quite different than when you go to a theater and watch one performer do 70 minutes. Um, and we expect, and, and yeah. I, I would say what I do at the, 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 the burlesque shows is not my stand up. So I, you don't I, do jokes. I, um, would it be more like uh, MC? It, I call it quasi improv. Basically, I, uh, the audience will write questions about love, sex oh, and relationships and I'll, I'll answer those. Uh, oh, okay. and, that's, that's and I, I also try to make sure that the advice is right as best as I can. Uh, Good. So like Sue Johansson is a huge influence. Uh, mm. and, uh, yeah, I get to touch on subjects, uh, that a, a lot of other comics don't get a chance to touch on. Uh, yeah. It must be uh, hard to break it up like that. So you don't have to just do a set. You can do something else. Yeah. And some of the things that I've done through that, I've, been inspired that I can been able to bring to a club set as a standup. So right. it makes, makes a little bit of a difference. Good. Uh, what's now, you, you, obviously you, you write every day. Uh, do you, do you have like a set hours that you write or do you, do you, I do write you, in the morning. You write in the morning. Um, and I'm a morning not, person. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
that's where we are completely opposite. I am not. A yeah, that's person. why probably I'm not a stand-up comic anymore. Uh, <laughs> the other night I had to perform like at ten thirty at night from Winnipeg. I was the last, the second last. I'm like, oh my god. No, I used to. I like getting up really early. I um, when I had kids, I I was a playwright, and I worked for TV, and I had to do stuff. I had a schedule for that, so. I really started to go, um, a friend of mine, when I had two little kids said, never give your good creativity away to um, housework. So I always just did my writing in the morning and I think better in the morning. So I always get up, I make my coffee and I probably write for about an hour. Now, after I came back from the Winnipeg Comedy Festival Sunday night, I did not write yesterday, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I've got so many projects right now. I've got two plays in development. And so I'm always at different levels. And then I'm teaching a writing course online. So I prepare a lot for that. It's Sunday mornings. Now, people and, people uh, have access to that from your from your website? Yeah, I, they sign up for six weeks and I teach them structure of story. And uh, and then um, that was, a, it's called writing in your pajamas. Um, and then for people that come are usually over 50 because that's my age group, that's who I target. And then um, when I teach a, a comedy class, it's called Making the Dog Laugh on how to make your stories funny, whether you're on stage or on the page. So like how do you build the comedic uh, premise? That one is usually a one-off and we do three hours and we have breakout rooms and stuff like that. But that those writing classes, I think, you know, that's what's so good about right now. People are wanting that kind of ongoing stuff and, um, with Zoom, like I can bring in, uh, I had a reading of a play of a book at an author's festival and it was on YouTube and I just brought in like three minutes of it for video. And I thought you can really make your classes interactive and a lot of fun right now. Yeah, no, I, I could, I could see definitely the advantages of that. Uh, I, uh, I, um, shoot, I had a, oh, the morning pages. Have you heard of this? Yes, I did those morning pages for a lot of years. I was a playwright and I had a big success in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And then I had a big failure and I couldn't write. I had a, like a real writer's block. I couldn't, I couldn't um, just go back and be a normal, just write. I was very free before that. And so I did the morning pages for uh, Julia Cameron, three pages. And I did her old book. I did all the weeks. God. And I mocked people who did it. And then I did it. Um, and I really liked her. But at a certain point, I wanted to write more about what I observed than what I was feeling. Now, maybe other people got stuff from the morning pages that I didn't. So my writing classes are always about like taking field trips and trying to observe what's going on and becoming a better writer by getting outside of your own thoughts. Like instead of telling us, what you feel about things, like show us what you are seeing. And that's where the comedy comes from. Or if you're going to be a dramatic writer, it comes, whatever what you observe is your point of view. I find people come and they think that writers that are comedic do like that, that they could learn how to do that. And I, what I say is what, if you go and sit in a coffee shop, you're going to observe something. And it's either going to be funny or it's going to be serious. But that's your point of view. Where like comedians just tend to look at something in the comedy, uh, coffee shop and find something funny in it. You know, yes. so it's got to be the way your mind thinks, right? So I really encourage people to think, to encourage them to really know what they think. Mm -hmm. And then for the comedy writing class, I teach them how, if they've got a sense of humor, how they can make it work structurally. Yes. And uh, I really, I like teach status work and um, teach, you know, how to really write things deadly serious so that they'll be funny. Like, you know, I think people put a lot of, I think when people don't know how comedy works, they put a lot of wink in it, like wink, wink, LOL, like probably we've said too many times today. But it's like, if you, you know, um, do you know Dan Redekin from The Frantics? Yes. Uh, I don't know if he knows me, but I've met him a few times. Yeah, he's a nice guy. And I, I was asking when I was teaching at Second City, I said, could you, I, I like asked about 10 comedic writers, what's the best thing to think about in terms of comedy? 
And he had a great line. He said, drama is serious and comedy is deadly serious. And I thought, yes, comedy is about being deadly serious about something that other people wouldn't be deadly serious about. You know, and I'm, there's many rules to comedy, but it was just so true because I think so many people wreck comedy, especially, you know, when you read scripts and stuff, you're just like, there's too many winks in it. Like everything's a joke and you go, it only works if everyone's playing this deadly serious. Yeah. And then the comedy starts to work because you've got the lines to live off of. Yeah. I, um, for me, uh, I, I love the stories behind a lot of comedy. There was a, uh, when I was living out East, I had lived in Montreal. I had worked for just for laughs and I had gone back East and I was missing comedy because there was no place to perform like no club to perform in. And, Down east or, or in Montreal? Uh, in, in, in Halifax, sorry. Oh, okay. far, far, The far east of Canada. <laughs> uh, but there was no place. And uh, so we we started a, a, a comedy night, and, and one of the people that, that came out to do it was uh, uh, a woman in, in um, I'm going to say, uh, in her late 50s by the name of Bev Moore. And uh, she worked for the government. She was a grandmother from Newfoundland. And uh, uh, she she had had a heart attack. And while she was staring at the ceiling in the hospital, she, you know, made a bucket list of things to do. And uh, comedy was one of them. And Was it fun? I bet you she was great. At first, she was, uh, like, she had a great bubbly spirit, but she was pulling all these props and characters and, and, and uh, like, I... I I wanted to encourage her, but I wanted to encourage her to be her on stage. And yeah, that's before, the hardest thing about comedy, isn't it? To just be yourself. Yeah. And, and just after I moved away, she did 40 minutes uh, for uh, a, a breast cancer awareness. And she, she just killed. Just laugh, 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 laugh. And the thing is, though, the younger people in town, when I wasn't there, she had difficulty getting stage time because no one... Well, they they looked at her and just assumed, well, you're not our market, even though they had seen her on stage killing every time. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think that's just, that's a, an amazing loss to the arts community to not recognize uh, how hilarious she was. So Bev Moore, if you're you're out there, please do comedy again. Yeah, no kidding, Bev. I want to see you. That's great. Um, yeah, I think we put people in boxes, especially women. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, I mean, I was in comedy where... We never got as much stage time as guys, and it was 10 men to one women, woman. And one of the things that really changed in terms of energy-wise was when uh, five years ago, Winnipeg Comedy Festival decided that CBC TV decided that all the galas would have 50% gender uh, representation. But it wasn't just that was better on stage. It was better backstage. The whole dynamic of how we all communicated with each other backstage changed. And it, it, and talk about uh, punching up. It was, it was finally fun back there. Cause it, you know, for, you know, I worked, I have a joke in my show, you know, it was 10 men to one woman and it was always somebody mansplaining my joke to me. Yes. And. And and then dry humping my leg. And you just go, I've stayed in the game and worked really hard because I am not going to let that defeat me. But that is a really hard way to have to work all the time, yeah. especially for young female comics. And then, um, you know, anyone LGBTQ is also bullied by a certain type of person. So it's great that there's more representation now and there needs to be. And that's why I think that we're probably going to have different ways in which we all tell our stories. When you have more diversity backstage, that's that's the way comedy evolves will become more diverse and it won't be just set up punchline, set up punchline, different kinds of storytelling. And going back to Hannah, whether anyone, you know, I mean, it, it, people, she even says it in Douglas that people criticized her because it wasn't real stand up. Um, I, I, if, I think it, I just think it was so more than just stand up. Yeah, she got criticized that it wasn't traditional stand up, and um, and it really wasn't. But yeah. her point, I think, whatever happened as a result of her and Tig Notaro and all those people, 
they have broken things so that people can have other ways they do their comedy. The more diverse it is, I think the better it is. Yeah. Yep. And also oh, there's so much more comedy than when we were growing, when, I don't know about you're younger than me, but just how much, there's yeah. so much more opportunity today to be seen and to find your niche as a comedian because there's so many outlets, right? Yeah, well, it's all online right now, uh, but it's... Uh, yeah, but just even, yeah. just no, even no, it's, there's communities and small communities that have comedy nights and um cabarets and things yes. like that when i was growing up there wasn't such a thing no there was yeah. in, in canada uh for a lot of places yuck yucks was synonymous with comedy because yuck yucks uh ran tours to all these small communities and so that was the only comedy that they would see and so when those people came to the larger cities they wanted to go to the yuck yucks because yuck yeah. yucks was a generic word for comedy club that's a really good that's Excellent. That's exactly what it is. Did you do Yuck Yucks? Uh, I did. I actually, I even managed the Halifax Yuck Yucks when it uh, finally opened. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. I just and wondered, uh, I, and yeah. then I know, was it Yuck Yucks or was it Yuck Yucks that you had to sort of just play Yuck Yucks Club for a while? Is that it? I don't know that story. Uh, not my personal story, but the, that, that they usually sign their acts to be exclusive. Right. Uh, and uh, they they do. I think uh, I think Yuck Yucks has been one of the best things for comedy in Canada, but it's also kind of been one of the worst things for Canadian comics in Canada. Uh, right. it, it's it's uh, they're they're about promoting the brand, which is good for them. And they get give comedians a lot of stage time, especially when they were running the tours. They don't run the tours as much as they used to, but it used to uh, a comic would sign with them and then you know, go to Nunavut and, you know, hop planes over to all these little communities. Uh, and, and it's a chance to do a bunch of different rooms in front of a bunch of different people when you don't have the budget or the, the knowledge of how to promote yourself ahead of time. Well, that's great. That's great. But the thing but is, is you never yuck earn yuck that knowledge. No. And does Yuck Yuck still have that kind of power? I know Absolute Comedy and other clubs have got, uh, ab like, Absolute yeah, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot more clubs uh, in, uh, in Canada now, uh, especially at West. Like a number of clubs all left Yuck Yucks at the same time at West and rebranded, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they, they ran similar policies as well. Absolute is, uh, has some one of the best kind of clubs you can uh, like the, the, the way that that uh, Jason runs those those clubs it's just uh, amazing with how he creates such a perfect atmosphere for comedy to happen in oh that's um, great i love hearing yeah. that because i know um they're in kingston and um i'm yeah, from they, that area they have kingston yeah. ottawa toronto and i think there might be is did you say barry i i, I, I think they might have I a know, club. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah uh yeah. ottawa was their first one and uh they it's quite successful oh that's uh, great great yeah it's uh, uh, oh, I just went off. T I'm sorry. I'm having a little bit of a brain fart. It's um, uh, but it's it's been a very much a pleasure. I know there's something else I wanted to ask you about, and it's it's uh, is it about my soft bottom? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd bring that joke back because it's not you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, Oh, uh, what? <laughs> we're having that that moment of trying to get through the doorway at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you go ahead, and then I I, I will I will. No, I was I, just going to say Mike Berbiglia. That's like I took like 10, 20 minutes to remember that. So if you take twenty minutes to remember what you were going to ask me. Yeah, Mike Berbiglia is yeah he's amazing. Have you? Um, uh, oh. Dang it. I'm just, uh, what, what are the things? Okay. For, for me, this is kind of a reverse kind. I don't want to call it a reverse thing is when I started, I sort of fell into doing the burlesque shows here in Montreal. And then I started contacting, like if I was going to Toronto to, for stand up, I would contact the burlesque rooms and I usually would get no's even if I had sent tapes, et cetera. Uh, it wasn't until I was able to get like a, a burlesque performers to, to give me a reference to these uh to the burlesque producers in toronto did i actually start getting responses and then when i yeah, did the first burlesque show in toronto it was like oh my god 
we can't believe this. And then I was able to be seen on these because the automatic assumption of somebody who looks like me on a burlesque show. Uh, uh, you're going to keep your clothes on. Yes. Well, you, there's, there's men who look like me who do burlesque. And the fact that I'm saying that, uh, no, my act is more comedic. Uh, and that saved it. Like, Oh, okay. No, no. It's it, that, that made them very nervous. Cause it's, oh, it's uh, I see. Okay, okay. they're, they're more about body positivity. Uh, and so they were afraid oh. that I was going to go and. Oh, you know, I see. You're going to mock. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so, so what were you thinking? What was your was there a question in that or you were just uh I, I was just I I just wanted to, to to reference in the fact that 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 there were there's I think there's there's blockages are now happening in, in different areas. Uh and the fact that things have been opening up. Like I I've run I probably run more open mics than anything else. Uh and I've always only I try to book diverse voices. Like I'm not gonna have a bunch of guys in sweaters with beards, when I I can pick from from people with different world experiences, and, mm -hmm. and I I always think that that produces a better show and it keeps the audience engaged for most all of the show, mm -hmm. and, and um, if you have a philosophy, I you're you're producing mainly for yourself. Mm -hmm. What what do you think about diversity? You obviously have, you've already said that you enjoy diversity in shows. Uh, well, it's not it's just that we need it as human beings. We have to yeah. be more diverse. I mean, we're letting a lot of people who've never had a voice or not keeping them in the mix, whether it's female. For me, it was female. Then it was transgender. Then it's black, color, people of color, indigenous. It's like the more we have this represented and people's stories represented, the better our work becomes. And I think it'll be uneven for a little bit because you're there's people trying to like you know one group gets more notice this week but in the end everybody should have a seat at the table yes. and uh in my i do produce my own shows and you know last time i looked around and i went i'm just picking my friends like that's got to change like i Pick my friends and the people I worked with at Second City, the people I've known at, on the debaters. So maybe I should go a little bit further in when I put a comedy show on for Christmas. And it's not just to go, aren't I being a good political, per, politically correct person? It's more like, oh, I am, I have this blind spot that I am not putting people um, and including people in my circle. and. Until I think we all say that about it and say we do have a blind spot, uh, yeah, you know, it, we need to do that in order for it to all get better for us comedically, but also as a culture. You know, uh, so, I, yeah. I think that is some wise words, um, most yeah. definitely. Um, yeah, be, yeah, we're we're trying to erase the bride the blind spot in. Uh, I really hope no one's offended by me using the word blind in a negative sense, but uh, we're trying to remove the blind spot uh, from society so we can all see each person, well, we're each person also being represented. We're being told it's in our face and it's real and there's no looking away. And so to me, it's like, I can be very comfortable in my own little world and say, I'm very open-minded. Mm -hmm. But then when you actually look closer, you go, you, you still aren't as open-minded as you think you are. And the more exposure to seeing the lack of um, fairness in all this, the more, more you know, then it's, I feel like we can't look away and we're at a time in history where we cannot look away. And especially in comedy, we're, we're, we're ignoring a, a huge portion of our audience by just having one type of voice on stage or one type of way of telling a story, whether you're in a club or in a theater, there's just, we're as diverse stories, We the more diverse the stories are on stage, I think that's where then it starts to be, we're not so concerned about every little thing. We can now start to say, we're, we're putting more out there. And you know, a few years ago, certain things were taboo or really avant-garde to do. And now they're just a part of our society. And, so I think this is a time when hopefully a lot of what we're going through right now, we will just be like, 
okay, we already do that now, you know. But I think unless I and other people like me, if we just pretend we're all doing the best, I, I don't think it can move ahead that much. It's yeah, it's more than just say it's due, and it's yeah, it's, it's due. Awesome. Yeah, it, it's awesome that you do do that. Uh, we've been live for a little over an hour, um, and uh, it has been great to talk with you, Deborah. Now, your your comedy, your writing, and your your comedy classes, uh, people can find out the schedule and, and book them uh, on your website, which is on screen right now, which is yeah. dot ca. Yeah, and I got one coming up at the end of November, and uh, that's the comedy writing one. But they they're kind of ongoing all the time. So I really appreciate your time, Paul. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I, I, I love chatting with you. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, we're probably going to log off at this point in time. I don't have any fancy end music. Uh, but okay. I definitely... It was a really good opening. I thought that was great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I utilized a free website service. Uh, but uh, Deborah Kemet has been my guest. I'm Paul Ash. This has been They Talk Funny, and uh, she definitely talks funny. So check out her website, check out her courses, and check her out online. Have a good evening.